to John Saunders. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's so lovely to be here. Um, thank you very much. Um, I have to say that I got a bit jealous last night with you all going to dinner. Um, and I was invited to come to dinner, uh, but I knew that I had to work on this presentation because I had like a rough structure. Uh, and then after hearing Peter's keynote and the beautiful keynote yesterday, I sort of went, oh, I'll just ditch like most of that and start again. <laughs> um, and I thought it's gonna be a long night and I looked at the, the wine list uh, in my hotel room. <laughs> And I thought of all of you drinking beautiful New Zealand wine and I turned green with envy. <laughs> and I thought, it's only a little bit more to get a bottle. I did. Yeah. That's what I thought. <laughs> so I did. Um, and this morning when I woke up to uh, a phone call actually from reception, because I had emailed them the presentation asking them whether they would print it and bring it to my room. Uh, and they said, are you sure? Because it is uh, 97 pages. And I said, oh, no, hold that. Uh, so I've cut a tiny bit out. Uh, it's still way too long. Uh, and so welcome to Death by PowerPoint. Dramatic <laughs> transformations, how drama can improve literacy and engagement in the early years, primary and intermediate years of schooling. <laughs> I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work in Australia, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, and I'm very blessed to wear this Punamu, Punamu um, which I was given uh, after the first invitation I had to, um, to present for Drama New Zealand two years ago. Um, and so I, I wear this with absolute pride and humility today. Um, I thought I'd kick off um, because I love a fairy tale, um, with a fairy tale in fact, um, to sort of set the mood and I came across this last night actually, <laughs> um, no, I found it years ago and I thought this is perfect, so indulge me. Once upon a time, all over the world, no children went to school because schools hadn't been invented. But children and young people still learned all they needed to become useful grown-ups in their communities. They did this by listening to their elders, who told them wise stories and sang songs with them. Together with the adults, they danced and made music and performed the deep ceremonies and necessary law and laws of the people. With the adults and each other, they drew patterns and painted pictures and fashioned sculptures to create and communicate ideas and meanings. They invented stories that, although sometimes make-believe, were models of both the real world and other possible worlds, and they brought the models to life by acting them out. They learned by making artful and artful play, and from all these experiences where the body and the senses, the brain and the emotions were all working together in constructing harmony, they made order and meaning for themselves in their personal, relational and objective worlds. Then as life for humans got more complicated, some very odd people invented a special place to learn and called it school. <laughs> and the idea caught on, at least among the grown-ups, who decided that in school, knowledge and compliance were the same thing. So they invented the Protestant work ethic, which divided work and play, and led to places for work called classrooms, where you learnt sitting down, a good class was a quiet class, and play was less, left firmly in a special place called the playground, where nothing important happened. The body and the senses were ignored and the emotions banished and the brain was the only thing that counted. And they uh, turned learning from a verb into a noun and called it the curriculum, a document in which what young people needed to know could all be written down and could be carefully controlled and what they did not need to know could be excluded. The excluded bits included the arts. This was because the odd grown-ups thought that music was noisy, visual arts was messy, and dance and drama were both noisy and messy. <laughs> if they happened at all, they were allowed to happen outside of school time or on wet Friday afternoons. 
Their exclusion was also partly because another strange thing had happened in the world beyond schools. Proper art had become something only for grown-ups and could only be created by special people who had a gift from the muses and had, had special training, which of course was available outside of school. <laughs> and I think John O'Toole's uh, fairy tale rings really true for me. Um, certainly in Australia, where the arts are continually pushed to the side uh, of the uh, curriculum and to the side of school. Uh, and that was certainly my experience as a student in you know, the late 90s, um, <laughs> uh, growing up in Brisbane. And I thought that was a nice way of, of also acknowledging that we have so much to learn from, uh, from traditional cultures when it comes to learning. Uh, and I think, you know, for tens of thousands of years, uh, cultures here and cultures in Australia have taught so much through the arts, and I think we still have so much to learn. I have broken this into several parts. <coughs> I can't remember how many. <laughs> Part one is the now. So I thought we'd talk about the education context, the current education context. And I'm talking broadly, and I'm talking uh, really about Western uh, education here. So um, I think that there is this obsession uh, of high stakes, multiple choice testing which shows us that there is one right answer, not multiple divergent ways of getting there and thinking. Uh, there is the standards movement, which is becoming, a, I think, an epidemic. Um, and uh, Ken Robertson talks about um, this as, and PISA <coughs> actually, further down, the Program for International Student Assessment, which from next year will uh, assess creativity. <laughs> um, but let's keep the arts right to the side. Um, but the, the PISA, when PISA started, it got very little attention. People sort of, oh yeah, whatever. Uh, with math reading and science scores. Now it, it sort of sends shockwaves through, uh, through the international media and community. And education ministers kind of show off. Uh, and Ken Robertson talks about it like education ministers comparing their biceps uh, with their uh, country's PISA scores. Like that's how sick this has become, I think. We see globally a narrowing of curriculum um, and a reductive focus on literacy and numeracy. What literacy means, this tiny little bit, uh, rather than what literacy really means, uh, which is about uh, something much broader. Uh, in Australia, I'm sorry to say that we have data-driven schools, super data-driven. Uh, sometimes in primary schools they'll have um, a data wall. Do you have those? Oh. With the green, the, the yellow and the red, and the student faces of where they currently are. Yes, lovely. Because uh, I think that's shit data, uh, not rich holistic data which actually helps us as teachers. Uh, ongoing criticism of teachers. We all are doing such a bad job. Mm. Terrible, terrible. <laughs> and we go to uni and we learn nothing. We don't learn anything at uni, apparently. Uh, we see cuts to the arts, arts education. Uh, we see cuts to pre-service teacher education. Uh, over the past 30 years, we've seen um, that time allocation for the arts and pre-service ed courses reduced and reduced and reduced. And so often, teachers enter the profession going, I want to teach the arts, but I don't feel particularly comfortable and confident in doing that. Um, we see a focus on STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths with this sort of, I, I think it's like a, a false dream that STEM will uh, be the answer to all of our prayers in the 21st century. <coughs> rather than a focus on STEAM and acknowledging the role of the arts. We see really high rates of disengagement, student disengagement, particularly in the middle years, the intermediate years, yeah. is that right? Sort of years six <laughs> to 10. Um, we also see, uh, I came across an article that said that in Queensland, where I had started my teaching course, in the last year or two, the suspension rate of kindergarten students, prep, just before year one, had doubled, had doubled. Within a year, that rate had doubled. So I think that is a pretty bleak kind of um, scenario. 
uh, of where education is. I know that New Zealand is at a very exciting time um, with the national standards going. Um, and I think we're all looking uh, to New Zealand and to all of you. So no pressure, um, <laughs> but we need some hope from you. <laughs> And all of this is really interesting because when we have international policy like the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, it actually states that the arts and play and culture are, are actually a human right, not an optional extra for a Friday afternoon, where state parties recognise the right of the child to rest and leisure to engage in play. Uh, and recreational activities appropriate to the age of the child and to participate freely in cultural life and the arts. How freely can children engage, I wonder, in cultural life and the arts? State parties shall respect and promote the right of the child to participate fully in cultural and artistic life and shall encourage the provision of appropriate and equal opportunities for cultural, artistic, recreational and leisure activities. I really do think it's a human right and I think it's no accident that uh, it's enshrined in the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child. So, enough from me for a moment. I want to ask you, what do you think are the education imperatives for the 21st century? What are the most important things that we need to teach now? I wonder whether you might like to turn to the person next to you or jot down a few ideas. Do you mean what we think or what, what you the think? general? No, general I think from you as an educator, what do you think? I'll give you a moment. <laughs> All right, lovely. What have you come up with? <laughs> Kate? Um, uh, well, what did you say about six months? We were saying that you remove the children out of that whole system of assessment that's going to be That's right, and that we want to do collective learning mm -hmm. into collective experiences rather than individual uh, assessments of achievement. Yeah, lovely. Other thoughts? We've talked about, I'm sorry, oh, yeah, no, we talked about creativity. Yes. How we need to create thinking in all areas yes. of life. Yes, absolutely. The sciences and, you know, and yes. the, the jobs that the kids, our kids are going to be doing in the future may not exist right yeah. now, so, yeah. Children that can think outside the box. Yeah, lovely. We talked about building resilient children mm. and how um, we can, as teachers, we need to start modelling that it's okay and not take yourself so seriously. Yes, yes. So copy what we're doing and you talked about. Um, as uh, for the learners, they lack imagination yeah. and we need to bring it out to them. Yeah, yeah. encouraging that, encouraging imagination. Yeah. yeah. I think as well that, um, like from Bill's workshop, that critical thinking and mm. that, you know, I've got so many children that talk about, like, how bad Donald Trump is, but when you ask them why they can't answer that, that's mm. just what, for me, what they've heard other people talk about. And so actually, when there's so much input, being able to think about, <coughs> well, why is it saying this? Yes. And, yeah, that's yeah, critical thinking absolutely. about what they're being given. And with the sort of, I don't know, maybe it's not the advent of fake news, but like the amplification mm -hmm. or tsunami mm -hmm. <laughs> of fake news, that I think that's even more important now. Um, and when news is so uh, digitalised, that we really do need to be critical um, thinkers. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Finding joy, joy for us as teachers and also Yes, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. the, the Scottish Parliament actually yeah. talked to children um, uh, I think three years ago and created a report it was about what should school be like, what should the future of school be like. Talked to lots of little children um, in the middle and, and older kids and the report ended up being titled School Should Be a Joyful Place. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hold it it's, yeah. Beautiful. it's a beautiful read. But don't you think that that is School should be a damn joyful place, you know? And for so many kids who are disengaged and who um, you know, who are being suspended in kindergarten and prep, that that's, it's not, yeah. Other thoughts? Um, John, the, just to piggyback on that, Joy, um, I think there's something to be said about emotional intelligence in the wider spectrum. Yes, yes. Yeah. Because quite often joy is a, it's a lovely thing to see in a school, but it's yes. not the only emotions that, that em emergent um, souls uh, feel, and yes. if you make space for other emotions, and are able to give justification for feeling different ways. Yep. Doesn't happen very often in society, certainly in New Zealand, there's a difficulty there around masculinity and yeah. ex expression. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think one of, the, one of the imperatives is to address that, is to allow for emotions to be explored in the full spectrum. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. I think if we look at our curriculum document that 
the learning should be driven from the key competencies before the curriculum area. Mm -hmm. So I think it's about what does it mean to be an effective good person mm -hmm. before I can read, write and count. Yes. Yeah. yes. Isn't that the purpose of schooling? Mm -hmm. yeah. We talked about that um, students need to be able to <coughs> articulate what they're thinking and so they need to be able to discuss, they need to be able to explain, reason, justify, but they also need to be able to listen to the ideas of, of others mm -hmm. and with social media these days there's not so much because they get the gratification from someone liking their post or someone agreeing with them yeah. and so the discussion in that isn't always there yes. for many of our young people. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure there are heaps more too that you um, come up with. Um, I became really interested. I have a, um, an 18 month old niece, Sia, who is the cutest thing you've ever seen. Uh, and I've decided not to include a photo um, this time because uh, I was told that it's becoming an obsession. Um, so these are other children, not my niece. Uh, but I became really interested in what will school look like for her? What are those key skills that we will need, that we should be fostering? The uh, National Education Association in the US in 2013 came up with, actually before that, they came up with 18 skills uh, and competencies and then refined them or distilled them down into these four uh, broad areas, which they called the four C's of critical thinking, thank you Viv, communication, collaboration and creativity. And I think that they're really good. I think they're good, uh, good, good areas to be thinking about. And when we look at the practice that we've witnessed and experienced over the last two days, I think that actually everything that I've seen has fitted into those four C's, has actually helped develop different aspects of those four C's. Robin Ewing, my dear colleague, uh, mentor, friend, uh, supervisor of my PhD, if she's watching, I love you Robin, um, <laughs> thinks that however the four C's are not enough, that we need to go a little bit further than that. So she's added another four C's um, of curiosity. She thinks we really need to be fostering that curiosity in children. That wonderment of learning, I think. Connection. That connection, uh, that social connection, uh, and as we're becoming more and more uh, individual and isolated, I think that is really important. Compassion. And Juliana Saxton and Carol Miller, two amazing Canadian educators, write about um, saying that empathy is not enough. It's not enough to feel. You must feel and then you must take action. And that is what compassion is, she, they are. <coughs> and courage. I think courage is... I think becoming harder, uh, I think, um, to show and I think for us as teachers it's becoming harder to have courage uh, or we need courage more, I think, than we've ever needed it before. The OECD, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation. Cooperation Development, thank you very much. OECD Learning Framework 2030 has um, created a list of uh, skills and competencies that they've identified um, as really important uh, in, for the next 10 years, really, uh, of education. They put them into three kind of key areas of knowledge, which is disciplinary knowledge, of course, is still really important, but interdisciplinary knowledge, where we're learning across the curriculum, which is what drew me to working in primary schools, because you can teach across the entire curriculum. Uh, skills, cognitive and metacognitive, social, emotional, uh, <coughs> behavioural, physical, uh, and attitudes and values, personal, local, societal, global attitudes and values. They come up with 36, probably really hard to see, heaps, but lots of the ones that we've seen in those other uh, 4C, 8C, um, there, compassion, uh, creativity, critical thinking, curiosity, global mindset, gratitude, hope, human dignity, justice, mindfulness, trust, risk management, lots, lots of things I think to think about that uh, I think can get forgotten in the, the standards movement of the uh, teaching to the test and rolling out uh, endless assessment. 
<coughs> Michael Anderson talks about lots of these words, particularly the four C's, as being aerosol words, that they're like they're spray painted. That's my like best job at like 11.40 last night, <laughs> an aerosol style font. Uh, thank you, uh, Microsoft PowerPoint. Um, an aerosol word is sort of like spray painted and it's hard to hold on to. And I think that is a challenge for us. We go, oh yes, we need to be more creative or more imaginative. Well, what does that look like in our classrooms? And that's what I think drama as a pedagogical approach is so damn powerful because it is the tangible of the aerosol words. It is a way of going, I know how I can foster that creative thinking, that critical thinking, that um, communication skills, that way of collaborating through drama as a pedagogical approach. Uh, don't know why that... Great. Anne Harris, who's an academic at RMIT, came up with, did a lot of research into um, spaces where creativity was fostered. And she found that it wasn't about going, you know, we need to do this or we need to do that. It's something about creating a space where creativity can happen. And she talks about it as an ecology where all these different things work together in fostering that creativity. In curiosity, one of Robin's four C's, collaboration, problem solving, divergent thinking. I think, that for me, divergent thinking is one of the most important <coughs> skills. I, when I, I have a team of 30, I don't want everyone in my team to have the same way of thinking. I don't want everyone in my team to have the same knowledge and experience and expertise. I want a divergent group of people <coughs> who bring lots of different ideas together. Motivation, uh, confidence, persistence, innovation, uh, discipline, mastery, risk taking uh, and mistake taking, making, um, synthesizing and critical thinking. That all of those things need to be present in the ecology for creativity to exist. Part two. Oh, good. Okay, part two. This is, I have a bit of a confession that I'm a bit of a geek uh, and I really like the research, right? Love it. And I'm sharing this research with you, just some really big studies, as a bit of a have in your back pocket because I think more and more there's pressure on us as teachers to show that uh, the work that we're doing, the choices that we make are evidence informed uh, and research, research based. No, research-based, evidence-informed. Evidence, informed. evidence mm. you know what I mean. Yeah. Yes? Great. Right. <coughs> Here we go. <coughs> Some really big studies. This is Champions of Change by uh, Edward Fisk from 1999. I was in year seven that year. <laughs> um, and so it's very old, very old. The dinosaurs were roaming the planet when this one was written. Uh, it's a huge meta-analysis of a whole bunch of individual studies. Some of the studies that Fisk looked at had 25,000 participants, so they were really fairly substantial. Fisk found that the arts reach students who are not otherwise reached in schools and in communities. They reach students in ways that they are not otherwise being reached. The arts connect students to themselves and to each other. The arts transform the learning environment for learning. The arts provide learning opportunities for the adults in the lives of young people. The arts provide new challenges for those students who are already successful learners. It can push those successful learners even further. And it can connect, students, uh, connect learning experiences to the world, to the real world. And I think that's really important. It can be the glue that brings lots of other learning together. Another big meta-analysis was by uh, Richard Deasy in 2002. Um, and he looked at 62 individual studies uh, and the relationship between the cognitive capacities that were developed through the arts. He found positive achievements in reading, language and maths development across the arts. And there's a lot of research that shows, or people talk a lot about, I think music and um, reading, music and maths. Um, and there is a lot of research in that area. There is an enormous amount of evidence about drama and literacy uh, and drama and reading. Evidence of increased higher order thinking skills. Evidence of increased motivation to learn. Students wanting to learn when they're engaged in the arts. And we've seen that, I think, over the last two days. 
uh, and improvements in social behaviours. And really we know that this is in the wrong order because if we get the affective right, then the rest will come. If the affective is blocked, then there's no point on continuing. Robin Ewing in 2010 uh, did a really big piece of research looking at Australian and international research. She found that students who were engaged in quality arts experiences achieved better grades and overall test scores. In high school, they were less likely to leave school early. They rarely reported boredom. They watched less television. And as adults, they were more likely to be engaged in community service activities. One of the studies mentioned uh, was by um, a guy called Cattrall, and he followed that 20, uh, 25,000 students all the way through into adulthood. He also found that they were more likely in the States, they were more likely if they were engaged in the arts, didn't matter whether they were from low SES backgrounds or high SES backgrounds, they were more likely to vote, be registered to vote in the US if they were engaged uh, in the arts at school. I think when we think about what makes a good citizen, an active and informed citizen, I think that this is all really important in feeding into that. This is a very small study, but I think it's quite interesting. Um, it's uh, a primary school in South Australia, um, and they had a teaching artist working alongside a primary teacher uh, over the whole curriculum for 12 months. So th what they did was compare two year four classes. One was taught in a traditional way, one was taught using drama-based pedagogy <coughs> across the whole curriculum. They tested the kids at the beginning of the year, and they lined up on their uh, academic and non-academic scores. So they were able to do a comparative analysis and see what had shifted in those two groups with two different teaching methods. And at the end of the year, they were tested again. And this is probably a bit hard to see, but the green line is the arts rich line. The pink line is the traditional classroom. The first area is their literacy score, well beyond, uh, big difference. Numeracy, it comes a bit closer together. The writing score is where it really peaks there. And then there are four key competencies. Problem solving, planning and organising, communication and working with others. Again, it starts to um, pull apart. And I think that's just a really interesting, um, love a graph, uh, really interesting um, study to see the impact over a 12 month period uh, of using the arts in our classrooms. In Australia, there's a company called The Song Room who do work with artists in classroom across all of the arts. They did a study in 2011 that found that the arts increased confidence, school attendance, uh, academic achievement, and social well-being. Again, all the things that we know. This is the last one, I promise. I hope I'm not boring you to death. Uh, academics at the University of Sydney found all of the same stuff that all those other um, studies found. Really good. They worked with 15 schools, primary and secondary in Australia. However, what they found was that students who were um, in the same school but had arts experiences were outperforming their peers who didn't have arts-based experiences in their non-arts classroom. So they were applying and transferring the skills that they were learning in their arts experiences to their science, maths, English, technology classes, which I think is really interesting, the transfer of learning. You're all still awake. <laughs> Great, good. Part three. So there are these two, and feel free to jump in, Molly and Viv. Uh, up I call them two aspects of, learn, of drama. I can't think of a better name at the moment. Drama exists as a discipline, right? Uh, as a subject in schools where we look at how we make drama, how we perform drama, how we respond and analyse to drama. We also have drama as a pedagogical approach. And what we've really explored over the last few days is process-based drama, where we're learning through the art form rather than about the art form. Now, these should overlap a lot more, right? I have to say, I've been into quite a few drama classrooms where I've gone, mm, not a lot of drama pedagogy happening while we're teaching drama. That's interesting. But we can pull drama as pedagogy out and, and, and learn through that, teach through that. So that's what I'm really interested in and that's what we've been sort of exploring the last few days. I wondered whether you might, with the person next to you, uh, define literacy and define drama as pedagogy. How do you define those two 
things that we're kind of looking at at the moment. Just with a pair, maybe a whole sentence if you're feeling really ambitious, Molly. Uh, a couple of key words would also be fine. Okay, great. Super. Of course you've got it on the top of your head uh, during the holidays. Uh, where would you like to begin? Drama as pedagogy? Who came up with something? Your own words. Not all at once, please. <laughs> My goodness. I've yes. got one that's borrowed from the old social studies curriculum here, but I think that drama is pedagogy. It's the embodied way of exploring why um, people think, feel, and act the way they do. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Write that down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Juliet? And drama is pedagogy is a vehicle for learning about the human condition. About learning about the human condition. Beautiful. We had drama as pedagogy is not as hard as you might think. Yeah, oh, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not some mysterious magic, is it? No. Other thoughts about drama as pedagogy as learning through, with, in, around. Yeah. And then we said, just le leaping into literacy. Literacy is learned. Yeah. Literacy. Shall we go there? Too hard, it's just about being capable, more mm. capable in whatever realm you're working in, mm. whether it's political literacies or mm -hmm. you know, social literacies or, or I mean, writing oh, literacy. Yes, yes. Just being more capable, yeah. capable mm. and effective. Mm. Yeah. Uh, literacy is uh, about interpreting um, signs and symbols and mm -hmm. icons and in body language and yeah. um, terrain. That's what I think literacy yeah. is. Yeah. That and also communicating. Yes. Expressing. Expressing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
in schools in the UK, okay? Not here, uh, but I suspect they could be fairly similar. I wonder whether you might like to talk with the person next to you. What do you think is the most used and least used in life? What do you think generally, not in your classroom, generally would be the most taught and least taught of those four? I'll give you one minute. Okay, terrific. What did you come up with? What do you think? It's a bit tricky because this was done in 2013. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so dated. <laughs> well, it's 2019. There's all sort of informal text-based communication now mm -hmm. on, in the digital world. Yep. I still yeah. think that, that it's mm. um, off out of balance because um, there's a hierarchy in writing and reading are at the, you know, the important top. Yeah. and assessment kind of, you know, is always there with the writing and reading and so um, the t busy teachers kind of, you know, put the listening and speaking mm -hmm. to the side. Mm -hmm. We often keep listening to the functional. Yes. Are you listening to yes. my instruction because yeah. I'm the teacher? Yes. That's yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rather than active Not, listening. Have you, yeah, have you yeah. actually heard anything? Interest. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so we spoke about like reading and writing and like she said, um, the it is assessed, but we actually don't teach listening and speaking well and mm -hmm. of listening and speaking, listening is the one that we would teach the least. Yeah. We yeah. do not teach our children well to be active listening. I yeah. can't yeah. think of any resources or anything that we've been that I, any tools I've been given to actually teach listening. In yeah. music. Yeah. In music, right. Well, yeah. 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 So often it's taken for granted, isn't it? Especially, I think, you know, I mainly work with sort of middle and upper primary. By the time they come to me, I'm like, oh, well, they've already got that, mm. you know. I think that it's early childhood that teachers listening and speaking. So, you know, I'll, I'll focus on the others. Yeah. Um, what about what's used most and least <coughs> in life? We've sort of covered what, what we think might be taught least and most. Listening and speaking. Listening and speaking, you think? Yeah. Spot on. Gold star. So it, it sort of works in, in parallel to each other, in contrast to each other. We uh, use listening the most, which is really interesting because I feel like sometimes I'm not being listened to. Do you know? <laughs> Great, you're listening now. Uh, speaking, reading, and then the least used is writing. But it is the most taught. Uh, then reading, then speaking, and listening last. Of course, reading and writing are a bit more complex uh, than speaking and listening. So you can understand some more time. Uh, but this, my understanding is that this was actually, uh, you know, sort of huge steps um, in how much time was spent uh, on those four areas. I just think that's interesting to take a step back from, uh, from, from what we're doing. Because I think that listening and speaking, of course reading and writing are deeply embedded, but reading and spe uh, speaking and listening are so deeply embedded in drama as pedagogy. What we've experienced over the last few days at this conference, I've barely written and I've barely read, but I have developed my speaking and I have listened actively and attentively. <laughs> so, a case study uh, of the, this way of working uh, is the School Drama Program. That's what I run at the Sydney Theatre Company. It's a program using drama-based pedagogy, using drama devices, we call them, and strategies, with quality children's literature, not our readers uh, that we have for phonics, uh, but quality children's literature, uh, deep, rich literature that's super layered. Uh, to improve student literacy uh, in English and also beyond that. Um, it's working in a transdisciplinary approach to learning when we're breaking down those silos. Love that image. Yeah, that was at uh, midnight last night. Found that one. <laughs> uh, and we work in this way that in, in traditional process drama, you might read the text, the pretext, right? At the very beginning of the drama. Or you might introduce that text at the beginning of the drama and then dive off into this world. What we want to do, or what we do, is use a picture book or a short novel, quality literature, as our, um, as our story. We're not reenacting what we've just read. We're diving in very deeply. We're looking at critical moments. We're using different drama devices and strategies throughout the text. So we, I've talked about it as an episodic text model. 
where we read a little bit of the text, we stop, we dive in. We might hot seat a character and interview them and find out a bit more, things that aren't said in the text. We read another episode of the text and dive in and use a different strategy. We might uh, create freeze frames predicting what could happen next. Then we read what happens next and uh, create a dream sequence, etc. So it's about using the text in that episodic fashion, which I find really useful um, because I, Dorothy Heathcote, who sort of started all of this work, ha ha could tell stories, could just pick stories out of the blue. And I can't do that, I find it really hard. So I like to know where I'm going with a story. Um, and that's why I like using uh, quality literature. But when we work with a group, we also create our own story around that story. And I think that's equally as rich. So we work with a, a teaching artist works alongside uh, a classroom teacher one lesson a week over a term using drama um, in that way. And we look at four aspects of literacy, um, inference and comprehension. So filling in the gaps, inferring, uh, in understanding, comprehending. Confidence and oracy, speaking. Creative and imaginative writing and descriptive language. So they're the four that we've chosen to focus on. Throughout the drama, if you've done one of my workshops, we've actually looked at all of those in different ways throughout the drama because different drama strategies and devices explore different elements of literacy, like role play, for example, or hot seating. Hot seating uses actually all of those. We are inferring and comprehending when we're being interviewed. We are practicing our oracy. We are uh, and we are actually acting as authors of the text in a creative and imaginative way and we're using descriptive language to answer some of those questions. So I find that kind of a useful sketch of where, where we go. It's 10 years old, it was started by Kate Blanchett and Andrew Upton um, 10 years ago with Robin Ewing uh, and over that time it's, um, we're even <coughs> across the Dutch, we're here, uh, well not here, we're uh, north in Auckland and yes I know that that is not exactly where Auckland is, uh, <laughs> I only taught geography for one semester. <laughs> so I should acknowledge that we uh, work with um, Applied Theatre Company, uh, Peter O'Connor's company in delivering that program in Auckland. Uh, but we've reached over 30,000 teachers and students in that time. So I'll share a tiny bit of my PhD research um, because I, I did my master's um, a few years ago. I thought, yeah, that'd be fun. How hard can that be? <laughs> um, that was really interesting. And it actually made me ask more questions than it answered. And so I started a PhD also because I just wanted to be called a doctor um, and get free upgrades on an aeroplane, uh, which I'm really hoping that does happen. Never. No, you're looking, never. Great. Just wasted three and a half years of my life. I was about to start to have, help someone who's having a heart attack. And... Oh, I'll we'll do some friends' friends that take them better. Yeah. <laughs> so I gathered data in 2017 exploring the students. So we tested the kids. Mm, that's for you, Charles. Oh. The theoretical <laughs> framework. We've got three friends with cultural development. We can talk about that later. Uh, I do not want the outside <laughs> examiner. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> Vygotsky talked about, for me, Vygotsky makes sense because he talks about um, things happening in a socio-cultural way where we, every function in the child's cultural development appears twice. First on the social level and later on the individual level. First between people and then inside the child. And for me, that really resonates with the way that we work in drama. I collected data. I interviewed students in small groups. I had interviews with the classroom teacher before, during and after. I made observations. I collected samples of work from the students. The students did a pre and a post test, the beginning and the end of the term, looking at a particular literacy outcome. I surveyed the students. Um, if you take nothing else away and you ever do any research, I created a pre-program survey with 47 questions. I thought, hmm, that's not enough for the post-program, I should add some more. So, 62 <laughs> questions for the post-program survey. It's too many. <laughs> so, 
So that was an example of the benchmarking task. We were looking at inference and comprehension based on our New South Wales curriculum and on an A to E scale. Uh, the A to E scale, we made a 15 point scale. So we gave each number, each letter a number. So uh, an E minus, the lower score was a one, the top mark you'd get was a, a A plus, a 15. We looked at the super six comprehension strategies, how we make connections in texts, uh, from our text to ourselves, from text to other texts we know, uh, from text to the world. We looked at how we predict what could happen next. Questioning, monitoring, visualising and summarising. So there were three case studies. This is the one I'm going to talk about. Year 5, 6 class at Waratah Grammar School, not the real name, um, with uh, Dane Everhart. There were 26 <laughs> students. There were four students who identified uh, that they spoke languages other than English at home. Uh, and. No, no students identified as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. This was a, a grammar school um, with uh, fairly, fairly hefty school fees uh, between seventeen and twenty-five thousand dollars a year. Uh, and we used the city by Armin Greta, who also wrote the island that uh, some of us explored. I worked with another group with the book Home and Away, and another group with Tricycle and uh, the Island. Um, that was a year four, five class. But I'm going to focus on Waratah Grammar School. This is the benchmarking. So when we tested the kids in week one and at the very end of the term, uh, the blue is the pre-program and the orange is the post-program shift in literacy. What you can see there is that there are some students who haven't moved. A couple of students, Alicia, uh, Zara, and there's another one in there, Genevieve. But they were already in the A band. They were already really high performing students. This is the C minus cut off that green line. And you can see those students who were failing in the pre-program have had the biggest shift in their literacy score. When we break that into gender, we have male students at the top, female students at the bottom. Generally, research tells us female students are outperforming their male uh, peers. Uh, male students having lower scores in literacy. And after the program, only one student, Jackson, still failed uh, that task, which I think is really interesting. So I have some vignettes where people are going to read out some of the student voices. <coughs> Collect the papers. So this is vignette one. This is just a snapshot. Because what I wanted to do is just give you a little bit of the student's voice. Um, because I feel like we've had these, these wonderful experiences, educators together, and last night I went, what can I do that's different? Uh, so, this is different, hopefully. So, vignette one, we'll read the name of the character. John, that's me, says, I'm having a conversation with Dane, the teacher, uh, about the benchmarking tasks. So is this what you would expect? Is this the sort of change over a term that, um, that you were, if you were teaching in a usual way? No, I think it's far more dramatic than I would expect. You see, the kids who are already scoring highly on these tests, to begin with, the pre-tests, they are less likely to have much more growth. And that's the same for most, most pre and post testing, because <coughs> there is not, much, not as much time to grow. But seven weeks, to be honest, is not a long time. But on average, across the class, there has been quite a significant growth from pre to post more so than I would expect. And I love that he goes, it's more dramatic than I would have expected. <laughs> Pardon the pun. Which is really important, isn't it? When we're doing research in education, we can never go, everything, it's all about one thing, one thing's caused this, of course not. So I wanted to go, well, if we're using this different pedagogy, is this what you expect? And he said, no, it's, it's much more dramatic. I wanted to talk about students' um, perception of drama. So I asked them in a question, it was an open-ended question, do you feel like doing school drama has helped you with your English and literacy? Why or why not? Vignette two, these are a group of students. Genevieve, I think it has because even though you're not writing, it gets your mind thinking and that, that, sorry, and that can enhance your English and literacy. Josh, yes, because we could approach it in a different way and it helped my imagination. Levi. Yes, because I understand people's actions more, and some of the words we used in drama I didn't know of. Therefore, when I found out what they meant, it boosted my vocabulary. Very good. Yes, it has. 
because I've learned new words that I had never heard of before, words that I didn't know the meaning of. Zara, yes, because it helps activate your brain. Reese, yes, it helps you think outside the box. JP, I do not think it helped at all, and I think it just became annoying that you're stopping and starting a book. <laughs> <laughs> What a wonderful student. <laughs> JP. Didn't help at all. <laughs> so I asked students uh, to respond to this statement. Uh, I learn better when we use drama in the classroom with a 10 point scale. One being that they strongly disagree, uh, five being agree, ten being strongly agree. And so I put the strongly agree, a seven, eight, nine in green, in the middle is yellow, and down the bottom uh, the strongly disagreeing is in red. Um, and you can see there, I think that's fairly evident where that is. Yeah, yeah JP agreed with that one. So yeah, interesting. That's why more than one data input is important. Uh, another question I find it easy to write following drama sessions. Again, we're seeing a, a huge majority of students there strongly agreeing or agreeing with that statement. That, that, that white page, blank page syndrome, I think drama really sort of stops that from happening. Uh, I feel more engaged in school after participating in drama. I was really interested in student engagement uh, and how we measured this. So this is how I tried to measure it um, with, with this survey question. Uh, again, we're seeing a strong agreement um, with, with that statement. Vignette three, mm -hmm. student oh, engagement. Roger. Roger. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. Roger. Uh, Roger was a bit like JP and McNair didn't like it, didn't like it. Roger didn't participate in any of the um, uh, interviews, um, which we only realised at the very end of the process. Um, but if we have a look at Roger, no, yes, Roger. Roger, mid-performing student, C to a B. So he did have a shift in his literacy. He didn't like drama though, he really didn't like it, which is really interesting because we know that one thing doesn't work for everyone, yeah, right? Absolutely. Every student is different. I'm so glad you pointed this out. Every student is different, you know, and it's what bothers me about some um, programs in schools where you go, it fixes it for everyone, this is what we all need to do, there's a golden bullet, stop everyone, stop what you're doing, just do this. It doesn't work. It might work for a huge majority of students, but it won't work for everyone, and it's the same with drama. It might work for a huge majority of students, it doesn't mean that you have to, you'll need to do something different as well. Okay. Taking me off track now. Vignette three, vignette three. Student engagement, Kia. Yeah. Well, you, you're like learning new stuff in a fun way. You're not just sitting down and working on a workbook or something, you're actually getting up and moving. Grace. It's better because you get to hear other people's opinions and yeah, it's really fun because you get to hear other people's opinions and you can take on other people's thoughts and yeah, <laughs> Chase. Chase, I think it's more fun because you get to move around to do everything. You don't have to just sit there and look down the entire time. Mm. <laughs> Engagement. Collaboration was another area I was interested in. One of those four C's, we talk about collaboration. Uh, Ken Robinson says that we work in groups but not as groups. Uh, and I think in drum we have to work as groups. So I was interested in measuring if students had a preference, would they work by themselves, they were unsure or preferred both options, or they prefer to work in a group. And there was only a very minimal sort of shift in, uh, in this, um, this question, uh, to that question. But when students were interviewed, they talked a lot about learning from their peers, learning in that collective zone of proximal development. Um, which is the way that um, Vygotsky is being interpreted by some um, scholars now, that we learn as a group and we're learning from our peers all the time. And students talked about that. So vignette four. Hi. It's definitely better working in a group because you get around, you have more fun and you're just sitting down and working and you get other people's opinions and you're, oh, you're like, you go into the character's shoes and you like, you think how they feel and what they do and stuff like that. <laughs> Reese, 
Yeah, I think it's, it's a, it is a better way because like, it's definitely easier to read between the lines. I also think that listening to other people's ideas was very good because like at the beginning of this, I sort of had a, an imagination, but not as much, and hearing different people's ideas is making me come up with more and more ideas. It's just getting better and better. The scripts and making our different scenes and seeing what, what's happening, I think it's much better. Mm. Mm -hmm. But learning from their peers was something really particular uh, that I was interested in. Another area was the interconnectedness of empathy, emotion and connection to character. And so one of the questions was a pre and post question that I asked at the beginning and end. When you read a book, how strong is the connection to the character? Um, and that sort of had not a lot of impact. There was very little shift there. Some students agreed, some students didn't, and lots stayed the same. When I asked another question, do you think you make a stronger connection uh, to the character? Um, sorry. Do you think you make do you think you make stronger connections to the characters that were explored in the school drama program than when you just read a book? We saw again nearly 70% uh, strongly agreeing, a few unsure and a few disagreeing with that. I think connection to character is really important in literacy. If we haven't understood that character, then how the hell can we write as that character or fill in the gaps of that character's experience? So vignette five focuses on connection to character. Genevieve, I do because you act out the characters and you feel the connection as opposed to just reading and making assumptions. Amanda, yes, because we do lots of different activities to do with the character and that really helps us step into those their shoes. Caroline, as I said in the last question, it helps us see it in a new light. Mm -hmm. Nearly there. I've changed the way that I think about characters as a result of drama. Again here we're seeing a, a huge, huge uh, majority of students going, yeah, I have changed the way that I think about particular characters through the drama experience. And I wondered about whether drama helps students see the world through the eyes of other people or take on <coughs> different perspectives. So drama has helped me see the world through different people's eyes take on different perspectives. Again, we're seeing lots of people strongly agreeing with that statement. Confidence is something that I'm also really interested in. We keep going, we want confident students. Well, and it was something that whenever I'd work with teachers, they go, oh, they're much more confident. And I was like, are they? <laughs> and how do you measure that? <laughs> uh, so, I feel more confident after the school drama program. Again, but uh, thanks, Reese and Roger. Um, <laughs> I feel more confident. Uh, I feel more confident in sharing my ideas in the class than I did last term or before school drama. Uh, thanks, Grace, JP, and Roger. No, I didn't, didn't feel that. Vignette 6, confidence. Uh, Reese, well, when I first started this, I just didn't really want to raise my hand or go in front of the class or do something. But now I find it actually pretty fine, and it gives you like feedback. And yeah, I really enjoy doing it now. I, Chess, I think I feel more confident in speaking and writing and sharing my ideas. Actually, in everything I do. Cassandra, because I feel more confident, and I feel like I can show everyone what my imaginations are and what my emotions are. Mm -hmm. uh, emotion, uh, imagination and creativity. Uh, interestingly, I didn't have a single question on my 62 question <laughs> survey about imagination. Um, there are a couple about creativity. Uh, Ken Robertson talks about uh, imagination as the root of creativity. Uh, and some people have, have different, different ideas about that. So the, a question I thought I'd share with you, I think my writing is more creative when I've done some drama. Huge agreement there, but not from Roger or Jackson. <laughs> uh, vignette 7, focus on imagination. It's very short, we're nearly there. Okay, Chase. Yeah, well, like what I said before, that you have like an imagination switch and you can just turn it on or off. Like normally if you're doing a persuasive text or something like that, or persuading someone, your imagination just turns off. <laughs> um, but when you're doing drama, you get to think and you get to imagine what other people feel like or what they do, and it like clicks it on in a way. <coughs> Chase. Yeah, well, like what I said before in class, <coughs> that you have 
Grace. Sorry, Grace. Have I, have I highlighted the wrong thing? No. Sorry. Uh, is this is the same what you said as Grace, I think. Grace, yeah, well, like what Chase said, it's like you have an imagination switch and you can turn it on and off. Like normally, if you're doing a persuasive text or something like that, or you yeah. uh, like the same. Oh, the same. The same. Oh, yeah. shit. I've done something wrong there. That was probably the end of the bottle of wine. Yes, I did. <laughs> so, here are our key findings from the case study. We see shifts in student literacy, in uh, comprehension and inference, particularly for male students, particularly those who were in those lower bands. We saw shifts in engagement, particularly through embodiment. Talk students and the teacher talked about their engagement shifting because they were doing. They weren't sitting at desks. Uh, students and the teacher felt that drama helped activate their imagination to turn on that switch. Students learned to collaborate and they learned through this collective zone of proximal development and they developed confidence. And there were two or three students who um, did not believe that drama had helped them in any way. <laughs> when we look across case studies, now I'm going to skip that, pretty similar findings across all three case studies, right? This is my beautiful piece of art that uh, looks at the inputs and the outputs. So these were the things that were common across the three case studies. We input emotion in drama. There's always some emotional engagement. It turns into empathy and that leads to connection in character. Embodiment, we embody the drama. We're up, we're taking it on and that leads to engagement. Collaboration is our input and the collective zone of proximal development on the other side. The aesthetic of drama, which is the term that I've kind of used, is going, it's kind of everything else. It's being in that dramatic space, in that world. Uh, and that leads to that shift in imagination. That, um, so there you have my brief version of the PhD, 73 slides later. Uh, <laughs> to conclude, I know you can't wait. To conclude, um, I feel like uh, uh, we can get bogged down sometimes and uh, told we're not doing good things or it can all be a bit too much. Um, and I love Maxine Green, who was uh, uh, um, an American philosopher, who said, the art that has been said cannot change the world, but they may change human beings who might change the world. And that's what I wanted to leave you with, that I think you have an incredible power as teachers to change the world, and I wish you the very best in doing that. Thank you.